Hello, I'm Samantha Mack, and this video was created as my benchmark project for the Painting MFA program at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Today I'll be guiding you through a virtual exhibition and accompanying footage containing selected works from fall 2019 to the present. This first room contains selected works from my first quarter at SCAD. During this time, I created a series of 100 black and white charcoal drawings entitled In Memoriam Illustrated, which responds to Alfred Lord Tennyson's famous poem In Memoriam AHH. Tennyson wrote this poem as an elegy for his friend Arthur Henry Hallam, who died suddenly of a cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 22. It is the origin of such famous phrases as, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all." The poem's themes of perseverance and optimism in the face of grief resonate deeply with me, as much of my recent work has reflected on the life and loss of my cousin, Gina Marie Mack, who passed away in 2017 at the age of 21. Like Tennyson did after the loss of Hallam, I found solace in creative expression, and art was the outlet that enabled me to persevere. The poem itself is an exercise in long-form incremental creation. It contains 133 cantos, and Tennyson wrote it over the course of 17 years. Each of these drawings responds to one canto of the poem. In October 2019, 50 of these drawings were exhibited in a group exhibition called A Divine at the Loft Gallery in Savannah, coordinated by Professor Denise Carson. The theme of the exhibition was inspired by the musings of Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein. Invention, Shelley wrote, does not consist in creating out of void, but out of chaos. These words, in Shelley's novel, have continued to resonate with me as my work becomes increasingly experimental, probing at the border between art and science as I contemplate mortality. There is an intoxicating allure to the transformative power of creation, but in channeling it, as Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein shows, we must not lose sight of our humanity. Paradoxically, it is often by embracing our own temporariness that we can get the most out of life. The conversations that have sprouted from this kind of work have been some of the most fruitful of my life. To again quote Shelley, quote, I feel my heart glow with an enthusiasm which elevates me to heaven, for nothing contributes so much to tranquilize the mind as a steady purpose, a point on which the soul may fix its intellectual eye, unquote. At the same time that I was creating these drawings, I was developing my personal color palette through the formal aspects of painting course, also taught by Professor Carson. I began by investigating a sunset color palette as a metaphor for fleeting beauty and transition, but I later delved deeper into my understanding of chromatic grays, created by blending or layering complementary colors, which literally break the understanding of light and shadow out of black and white terms. Faded memories with a tinge of color, departed souls who leave behind flickers of feeling, Chromatic grays embody these concepts. In addition to this revelation, I was learning that some surprisingly vivid colors, greens, purples, reds, appear in the body after death. Author and mortician Caitlin Doty explains that even after a person dies, there is still a lot of activity taking place in the body. Quote, cells break down and spread, bacteria and microorganisms are released, apocalypse in your inner ecosystem. I applied this information to an investigative series entitled Chromatic Decay, a set of nine wood panels displaying a gradient from pink to teal with chromatic grays in between, embellished by patches of growth-like embroidery added by drilling holes in the wood and stitching through them. I'm fascinated by how alluring this palette is and how using it can draw people into an otherwise repelling subject. I also applied this palette to my final series of paintings for the quarter, four larger works inspired by crochet patterns. In these paintings, I pursued a back-and-forth pop between positive and negative space, and in Bittersweet, I loosened up my application of paint to create areas of fuzzy blurring. As we leave the first room of the gallery, we enter a dark one. This space contains a selection of works from winter 2020, which was an even more prolific period. Invigorated by the groundwork laid in the fall, and spurred on by the encouragement of Professor Stephen Knudsen, Greg Eldringham, and Fibers Professor Jennifer Moss, I expanded my practice to new media and set out with the intention of exploring light and fibers in particular. This ultimately led to an exciting discovery. When various points of light pass through handmade lace and are diffused by a semi-transparent screen, the light is broken into mesmerizing shadows. This phenomenon, which I'm calling the lace light effect, is best viewed in person, but this clip gives you some idea of it. This was a eureka moment for me, and from that moment on I was propelled into a mad scientist journey of discovery, using electricity to breathe life into static forms. Unlike the tragic Dr. Frankenstein, though, I strove to ensure that these creations would not be cut off from humanity. 
I pursued themes of connection, interaction, and remembrance inspired by my great-grandmother, from whom I have inherited my love of crochet. As Professor Knudsen has often remarked, light passing through matter is a truly life-affirming phenomenon, and it was to this purpose that I dedicated my time, transforming my studio into a laboratory. With this larger light box work called Two Breaths, I discovered that one remote could be used to control two separate LED strips, which could be set to pulse at different rates, like two bodies in close proximity, or at once, like a pair of lungs. The disparity between these pulses made the work more interesting, though its components were few, because the unpredictability of the lights falling in and out of sync. For column, I incorporated a chain of handmade lace connected to a slow motor intended for mobiles. These were built into the box, which could be set to slowly change colors, remain a solid color, or to pulse. In this work, some of the lace light effect comes through and is complicated by circular motion. I concluded the quarter with three different investigations, a performance, a series of photographs, and a series of solar paper prints accompanied by a drawing. Ground Glow, pictured here, documents the burial of a light box built to the dimensions of a coffin. The photographs suggest the performance, and given the feedback I received on this work, I will likely return to this concept to create a video version of it in the future. All of these works and more were created for the ideation course. At the same time, I was taking theory and processes with Professor Eltringham. Some of the works that came out of that course included Chain of Light, in which I experimented with chain stitching LED rope, and Imprint, in which I extended the form of this rope from the wall and out into space. The title for imprint is threefold, referencing fingerprints, generational impressions left by elders on their descendants, and the visual imprint lingering on the retina when the work pulses from light into darkness. Applying techniques from my fibers course, I also created felted breaths, hollow forms made by felting wool over balloons. Finally, these images, designs for future works, also exist as a series of drawings in their own right. My third course during the quarter was materiality and meaning in fibers. Shown in this clip is my final project for the course, entitled Portal Panels, for which I built a wooden structure to house three sets of sliding stretcher bars, one housing a hand-threaded loom, one containing LEDs, and one stretched with naturally dyed silk. As Professor Moss informed me, black beam dyes at different levels of baseness and acidity yield the entire range of colors in my chromatic decay palette, from pinks and purples to grays, greens, and blues. In addition, black bean dyes are notoriously temporary. They will fade quickly through exposure to light, so the piece contributes to its own decay. This quarter, I was enrolled in Studio 2 with Professor Chris Williams in experiential and conceptual art with Professor Todd Schroeder, both of whom guided me in exciting new directions as I adapted my practice to home studio quarantine life. For experiential and conceptual art, I delved deeper into video, performance, and digital work, I created green screen crochet performances with an accompanying script and a digital blanket in which each square is a block of text containing the instructions for crocheting one square. I enjoy the perceptual shift that occurs in this written blanket between blocks of color at a distance and just legible text upon closer scrutiny. As we exit the gallery, I'm transporting you to my quarter-long endeavor for Studio 2, a large-scale in-home installation called Chrysalis. During the quarantine imposed by COVID-19, we find ourselves enclosed in a transitional state. Containment looms over each passing day, containment of the disease through containment of the self. Like butterflies or moths, which have long been associated with ephemerality, life, and death, we remain sequestered in the chrysalises of our homes, waiting for the moment when we can finally step out into the aftermath of the transitions that these circumstances have brought upon our world. When we finally do emerge, we will be forever changed. My recent work has been driven by dichotomies surrounding mortality, the ephemeral and the eternal, closeness and separation, light and darkness. In these times, perhaps more than ever, I feel compelled to address these dualities. Through the creation of 1,000 unique crocheted butterflies, which have been culturally connected to visiting spirits, I hope to create visual reminders of this temporary but life-altering phase of isolation, of those we have lost along the way, and of our eventual release. Crochet again lent itself to symbolic resonance within this work, replicating and expanding through contact with the hands, yielding delicate and ethereal forms. In keeping with my scientific investigations, I experimented with installing these butterflies in various ways. 
pinned as in a collection of specimens, contained in jars, suspended from the ceiling, or set free in my backyard garden. Ultimately, I hope to display the work publicly in the future, sharing the butterflies to signify their release as we ourselves return to socialization. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Please feel free to peruse the gallery or check out my work on these platforms. Thank you.